uh, namaste rivera welcomes and thank you so much for uh, you know making the time to be part of ahimsa conversations it's really an honor to you know have you here um so uh, i this is a question i ask everyone what is your earliest memory of either the experience or the concept of non violence yeah so it is connected i think as many people's memories are with a, an, an incident of violence when i was very small maybe 5 6 years old i had a very bad temper i was very angry uh particularly at my younger brothers who were really annoying and i used to grab them and push them up against the wall and scream at them and so you know my mom uh took me aside and said you can't do that anymore when you're angry you need to do something else with your anger and then you need to go back and figure out your solution with your brothers and to me this is precisely what we're saying with nonviolence we're not saying don't deal with the conflict we're not saying run away from the conflict we're not saying suck it up and just pretend like everything's okay we're saying channel your anger in a safe and healthy way so that then you can deal with the conflict in a productive manner. And so you know, she taught me to go punch a pillow or something and then go talk to my brothers and say, you know, I want that toy or whatever it is. And that was really fun foundational for me in terms of how to approach conflict. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. You uh, you do you know Fran Tar in New York? She runs this amazing program with youth on conflict. she said something very similar uh, i'll send you that link as well so rivera from that childhood what was the journey to what you have who you are today you you know you're a major activist and writer of nonviolence you're an editor of nonviolence news uh, so can you just walk us through the journey that brought you to the present yeah so um my father was a activist against the vietnam war uh he was very involved in trying to stop the war and help people not have to go and fight in vietnam he was a conscientious objector so i always had that in the background of my growing up knowing that piece of his history and aspiring to be a peace activist in that way um but i would say i didn't really connect deeply to nonviolent action until i was maybe oh i think 26 at the time when the occupy movement happened and where i was living it happened literally across the street from my house so it was, was very hard portland? to ignore was this portland this was, this was in santa cruz california okay yes So um you know it was hard to ignore it was happening right there and of course I came out of my house and went across the street and tried to figure out what was going on and it was very eye opening and I left that experience feeling like that was amazing and there's got to be some smarter ways to go about doing this kind of activism uh to be more effective at it uh so I kept generally looking to that but then when i sat down to write my first novel about nonviolent struggle the dandelion insurrection even though i had continued to show up at protests i recognized really quickly that i didn't know enough about nonviolent struggle to get my characters out of the mess that i had put them in so i googled it how to bring down dictators nonviolently and found that there was an entire wealth of knowledge and that so many people had been doing this around the world there have been like 50 nonviolent revolutions in the past 30 years and um you know like everybody i knew good gandhi was out there and dr king had done something but that was basically it but as i started to read i started to recognize some of the stories that i had seen growing up the revolutions in latvia lithuania estonia serbia poland uh, east west germany with the the wall coming down the people power revolution in the philippines which i would have been 5 when that happened and i recognized that the shape of my life and my lifetime had been strongly um influenced by nonviolent struggle and the ways that people were campaigning for environmental justice and racial justice and gender justice and all sorts of things 
Um, so that was really when I started to recognize how powerful this work is. And from there, it was deepening my understanding from simply the action of nonviolence into the philosophy, the um, kind of way of life, how we can have nonviolent systems and solutions. So if we have structural violence, we can also have structural nonviolence. And um, really engaging more and more deeply as I found out how effective and powerful the tools and practices are and how important they are to humanity at this moment in human history. Were you already a writer, uh, Rivera, or was it your interest in nonviolence that then took you towards writing? I had already written one novel about coal and climate change. Um, and so I was already a writer in some sense. Uh, but when I started to learn how powerful nonviolent action was and how we can really use it as human beings, I started to question the kinds of stories that we've been telling over and over and over again, that it seems like we are really telling the same old stories about violence. You know, the guy gets the gun, kills the villain, gets the girl, rides off into the sunset. This is the major theme of Hollywood, whether it's updated for setting or it's set in the past. You know, the hero proves himself through valiant warfare. Um, but what we're seeing around the world doesn't match that story anymore the real heroes of human rights, of social justice, are using, um, not universally, but <clears throat> in overwhelming numbers, they're using, using nonviolent action. And they have all the courage and all the commitment and dedication and sacrifice of the violent heroes of old. So I really started saying, why don't we start telling different stories? Why don't we see if we can replace what we're using violence for in these narratives with active nonviolence? And what I found is that it's not just a equitable substitute, it's actually even more powerful for readers at this time because it actually matches and measures up with their experience. Um, a lot of people in the United States are, are really growing disenchanted with war. Um, they're recognizing that if you sign up for the military and go and fight, you don't come back a hero, you come back wounded in your soul. Basically, you struggle with PTSD, you really question why we're fighting these wars of imperialism anyway. But those who are stepping up for social justice are finding meaning and purpose, a uh, sense of epic struggle that is existential at these times. Yeah. And yeah. to me, that is where good stories are rooted. Why Dandelion Insurrection? Can you, that's a fascinating title. So can you just share a bit about that? Uh, why your novel is called The Dandelion Insurrection? Yeah, so um, I love dandelions. They're these little golden flowers that are everywhere in North America, but they're actually not native to North America. They uh, came from Europe originally, but they're very sturdy. They're very resilient. They're one of the first flowers to bloom in the spring. They're good medicine for humans, uh, the leaves and the roots, um, and they're pretty indomitable. They can get snowed on and they still bloom. They bloom in sidewalk cracks in the cities. They're very, um, they're very powerful little plants. And so I yes. thought, oh, well, that they're would also, be a great They're symbol. also very mobile. Yes. They fly around. And that's another piece is that, you know, all children grab the little, gold, the white tufts of the dandelion orb and they make a wish and they blow on them. And then the seeds carry those wishes out onto the wind, which is really what activists do, right? Our communities are praying and wishing for a change. And activists say, I will stand up and I will work towards this goal. I will carry your wishes out into the world and try to help them find fertile ground. That's beautiful. Um, and when did you begin Nonviolence News? Because you are editor of this, uh, it's an online portal or shall we say an online service. When did you begin this? So this is a two-year-old project and it started out of um, another project I was involved in called Nonviolence Now, which sought to put 
um, advertisements about nonviolence into websites where violence was being promoted all the time. So game rooms, for example, or guns and ammunition uh, websites. So to occupy those spaces with a totally different message and try to see if we could interrupt that cycle of violence. Mm. So along the course of that project, we recognized that many people have no idea what nonviolence is. <laughs> they have no idea what it's doing in the world. They think it's something maybe Gandhi did. That, that's about as much as they know. Uh, so we started to collect the stories and we thought we'd maybe find 10 each week, but we have found 30 to 50 stories of nonviolence in action around the world each and every single week. And we know wow. we are only scratching the surface. Wow. That people are using strikes and boycotts, blockades, occupations, civil disobedience all the time. They are using... Um, constructive programs and alternative institutions all the time. And they are working really hard to implement um, nonviolent solutions all over the world, every race, gender, class, sexuality, uh, faith group, a lot of different political persuasions. It's truly incredible. How do you and map them and how do you find them? I scan the headlines of thousands of <laughs> articles each week. Um, so I always have my eye out for these stories. And the funny thing is they, they are out there, right? So, you know, you'll see them in Al Jazeera, you'll see them in The Guardian, you'll see them in MSN. They're happening and they're being reported on, but we're not, we're not making the connection that these are all stories of nonviolence. Right. So by collecting them under that banner, um, we start to see what's going on in a different way. We start to see that people are not advocating uh, in these stories for violence and violent solutions. Yeah. Um, and it's it's pretty incredible. It's eye opening even for me. And I've been studying this work ever since I wrote the Dandelion Instruction eight years ago, nine years yeah. ago now. Um, I had no idea it was happening on such a volume and a scale. You have said that radical is the new sensible. You've, I read that somewhere that you've written this. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, uh, how is radical the new sensible? Yeah, so a lot of people think about radical in terms of the word extremism. And that's not a good definition at all. It's, it's a really bad correlation and it, it doesn't really get into what radical really means, which is to dig down to the root of things. To be a radical is to go deeper and deeper and deeper into your line of inquiry until you find out the truth of what's going on um, or the truth as you see it. And so what I started to notice was that my activist friends were asking for what the power holders were calling radical goals things like housing, affordable housing and affordable house care, health care and ending our ongoing wars and redirecting the money towards taking care of the people. And to me, these are not actually all that radical. They are actually very sensible goals. They're very, very basic, very basic goals. Right. So to me, when we stand up for radical things, it's actually very, almost very sensible. Ah, uh, now I get it. Okay. How did all of this lead you to get involved with the Pache Ben? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Pache Ben? Pache y Bene. Pache y Bene. Thank yes. you. So one is if you could just briefly uh, say uh, what is Pache y Bene and how the campaign for nonviolent cities came about because that's how I first learned about you, your work on that campaign. Wonderful. So pace e bene mean, is Italian for peace and all good. And they are a 30 year old nonviolence organization that was originally started by Franciscans um, who are a, a branch of Catholics. And um, they hired me to first work on their social media and then do some of their program coordination for two big projects that they work on. One is Campaign Nonviolence, which organizes people in all 50 states and around the world to work for a culture of peace and active nonviolence, free from war, poverty, racism, and environmental destruction. 
And every year they organize a week of actions and there's been over 4,000 actions for those goals uh, in the past year. And so it's pretty remarkable effort. But the other program they run is this nonviolent cities program. And uh, several years ago, we heard about a group in Carbondale, Illinois, who were working on this effort to transform their city to a nonviolent city, recognizing how much structural violence is embedded in the way that we organize our policies and our cities or how we handle housing, what the police are doing, what our schools are teaching. They started to, they asked their local library to help them introduce principles and practices of nonviolence to different sectors of the city and to inspire their city council to actually become a nonviolent city, to be actively a part of the solution. So inspired by this work, we started to invite other people to form nonviolent cities groups. And now we have over uh, around 50 cities um, with small and large groups. Some of them do very um, targeted projects and some of them have very big projects going on, um, but all of them are looking at how we can make an institutional shift. Okay, all 50 cities are in the US? They are all in the US at this point. Okay. They don't have to be. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I'm sure eventually they, they'll be all over the world. Uh, Rivera, what are some of the markers? You know, you, you mentioned that it's about trying to shift institutions. So what are some of the landmarks that this campaign looks for or works on that would give us an, an idea that it's becoming a nonviolent city? Absolutely. So um, the groups in these 50 cities are working towards uh, goals such as getting their city council to proclaim that they are a nonviolent city, to actually say the words and commit to working, moving in that direction. They are working towards things like getting nonviolence in education into the public schools as the nonviolence uh, schools project in Rhode Island is doing, um, where they actually teach nonviolence and conflict resolution and they implement restorative justice versus punitive justice. And so they yeah. interrupt what we call the school to prison pipeline, which is a problem in the US where um, children, particularly black and brown children or low income children are being disciplined in their schools to the point where they're expelled and then they're put in the juvenile justice system and then they end up in prison for young people. And that has an extremely negative impact on their lives, uh, imp influencing their opportunities for education, work and housing. Uh, so restorative justice interrupts that cycle. They may also be working on things like getting their city council to divest from weapons and fossil fuels. They may be working on um, doing general nonviolence education, especially active bystander training, so that instead of being immobilized when you see violence starting to erupt on the say the subway, you know how to safely intervene in that without causing further violence. You know how to disrupt the conflict and help those parties back off and cool down and then kind of re-solve uh, their problem in another way. So this uh, must somebody... take a lot of training. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. You, you finish what no, you're no, saying. No, no, go ahead. Uh, but finish what you're saying, then I'll ask you about the training. Yeah, just that there's a lot more angles and directions that people can take with the project. And we let the groups uh, determine how they're going to work towards the goal of, of nonviolent transformation, um, depending on what their city needs. Some people are struggling with a large homeless population. So working for affordable housing or to get the police to stop um, brutally cracking down on the unhoused is a big goal. Uh, relatedly, because police violence is such a problem in the US, yeah. uh, working around racial justice and police brutality has been another big goal. Yeah, I noticed that 20 of these cities have voted to defund the police. Uh, how does that happen? Because does that mean that that city will no longer have a police force or it's just reducing the police force? Yes, so great question. Um, these cities, they're not all our nonviolent cities, although many of our campaign nonviolence organizers and nonviolent city organizers have been uh, allies to these campaigns, which are largely being led by uh, Black Lives Matter activists in the United right. States. Um, 
so when the cities vote to defund the police, usually what they're doing is they're taking a portion of the very large amount of money that US cities spend on militarized police, uh, police with big tanks, with guns, with very violent responses, uh, and redirecting that money usually towards, uh, or ex almost exclusively towards projects that prevent crime or conflict from arising. So um, forming street teams, unarmed street teams of people from those local communities or neighborhoods who can help deescalate the violence. Um, creating programs that help people stay housed, right? So that they're not having to live on the street. Uh, interrupting and disrupting some of the factors in, around poverty that um, often get people in trouble with the law. Things like broken taillights, for example, getting people help with fixing their taillights rather than just pulling them over and then having a negative or violent or deadly police uh, brutality experience. People who have been hurt either by poverty and or by uh, the violence which afflicts many poor people in America, uh, it would be very natural for them to feel embittered and have a rage. How do the nonviolent trainings work both with this rage at one end, the, the rage of the, of the poor and the, the dispossessed, and the kind of, uh, um, what shall, arrogance of power which uh, say somebody who's wielding a gun on behalf of the government uh, has, how do you find a, a space between these two very stark realities? Yeah, so there's a lot of answers to that, that question. I think um, one of the ways that the movements in the US have been leading the way and our nonviolent cities groups have been learning from what they're asking for or demanding is uh, to really question how we're criticizing the rage of the oppressed, basically, um, that they have just grievances and then how we can apply pressure to the people who need to make the first shift, right? When we see um, people upset because one of their family members has been killed by the police, um, the answer to that question is not saying calm down, stop being upset. The answer to that question is to go to the, the city council and the police departments and say, what is the matter with you? <laughs> Why this problem originates with you? Why do you feel afraid for your life and feel like the only solution to that conflict is to just shoot someone, right? Um, what What is your training? What is the, the culture that is giving you the sense of entitlement to do this? What are the laws and legal structures that have given you impunity? Because a lot of police officers have a relative amount of protection from the, the consequences of their actions. So changing the legal structure, changing the culture of this, um, going and introducing the solutions that resolve the conflict before the point of violence is all very important, right? If we have a violent conflict situation between police officers and unhoused persons that they're trying to evict or take their belongings from, the problem is not teaching the unhoused, the person without a house, how to be nonviolent towards the police. That's, that's one way. I mean, we do work with uh, people in who are without homes on building nonviolent uh, conflict skills. But in that scenario, we really want to be talking about why are our city councils making it illegal for people without houses to exist, to access uh, human rights of water and bathrooms? Um, why are they stealing their belongings and destroying their only shelter, which is tents? Why haven't we passed rent control to make sure there is affordable housing in our city? Why haven't we designated places for tiny houses or small villages? Um, why haven't we campaigned to get, um, we have many corporate landlords. So a lot of our rental housing is not controlled by, you know, your mom and your pop is controlled by huge companies who spike the rents so that people can't afford them. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, in, in the context of nonviolence, we need to question who we're asking to be nonviolent. Everybody can, right? But when a, a conflict breaks out, we have a tendency to um, ask the person who feels 
largely most powerless in our society to have the most degree of restraint and control rather than those who are most powerful or more privileged. Has this last, I would say, it's about a one and a half year of uh, um, the most intense phase of the Black Lives Matter movement. See, it was most of 20, right? Pretty much the whole of 20. It was in a very intense phase. Has that begun to move the needle on all these issues that you just described? Absolutely. That's how we see those 20 cities defunding their police and reinvesting. Oh, that's happened in only in the last one year. Yes, that is just this past year since the, the protests for George Floyd's murder. Um, right. These are the largest protests in US history. I mean, I know India also has had record breaking protests in the past year and in 2019. Um, and that size and scale is, um, it rattles uh, <laughs> people, maybe not the most entrenched racists or the most entrenched power holders, but the circles around them. And so we're starting to see corporations start to really prioritize diversifying their staff and their boards, um, which is very important. We're seeing uh, even groups like the Oscars in Hollywood get held accountable for the way that they privilege white people over non-white people, or the way that movies tend to favor white people stories versus non-white people stories. And we just see this ripple effect going through society. And it's really the result of, um, six years of dedicated organizing and some mass mobilizations from uh, the murder of Mike Brown and Ferguson in 2014 onward. Almost every year we've had substantial campaigns happening. Um, and also the vision of, of Black leaders in this country, um, many, many, many leaders um, who have really, you know, it's, it's a funny thing to say, but some of the most profound examples of nonviolence are being advocated by Black Lives Matter activists. Things like restorative justice and street teams and uh, community safety that relies on unarmed de-escalation and defunding the police. These are all profound nonviolence goals. As far as I know, uh, the Black Lives Matter mobilization has been almost entirely nonviolent with small exceptions. How is that an organic energy that is arising or is that due to training? Because I know that Martin Luther King Jr. is not necessarily a figure that many Black Lives Matter people relate to today. So what is the character of, or what is the uh, nature of this issue of violence and nonviolence within Black Lives Matter at the moment? Well, uh, I may not be the best person to speak to this um, because I stand as an ally to their to their goals and their movement. Um, of course, of course. I'm yeah. saying as somebody who's studying the issue of nonviolence, I thought it would be interesting to hear your perspective on it. Yeah, I think it's a, a an interesting situation in which, as you said, 95 to 98 percent of these massive protests around the U.S. this past year have been completely nonviolent on behalf of the protesters. Right, the police were not nonviolent at all. In fact, they used extremely high levels of repression. The counter demonstrators, those who um, are mad at Black Lives Matter, maybe racist, maybe they have other reasons why they're doing this, um, they were not nonviolent. They were quite violent. They drove into protesters, they shot at protesters. Um, so this is the context to, that we're having the conversation around. Uh, also, some of the violent incidents that were reported on um were people who like a police officer in minneapolis smashed in these windows and looted this store and then tried to blame it on the black lives matter organization so we have infiltrators and provocateurs um so i think it's hard to discern uh what the real conversation around violence and nonviolence is uh, if we're just listening to the media, because the media is in our culture of violence, they report on violence. They love violence. They love to talk about it. They love to blame protesters for single incidents or incidents out of context without um, really taking the time to do their journalistic responsibility and anchor what happened within the broader context of what's going on. So this is an area of 
you know, the work that we do to build a culture of nonviolence that is really important is like, how do does our media ethically report on it? Most of them have no clue what nonviolence is, yeah. right? So they're always reporting in ways that are generally uh, too disempowering towards the movements or unfair or unjust towards activists. So you, uh, therefore, the significance of what you do you know, of nonviolent use. So maybe this is a good point where you could share some of the details you were going to share, uh, planning to share, uh, show us. On Absolutely. The please do, yeah, let please me do. Pull that up. So as we mentioned, Nonviolence News uh, collects 30 to 50 stories of nonviolence in action each and every single week from around the world. So, in Nonviolence News, we report on everything from uh, yaki women who did this wonderful action. This illegal pipeline was put in place in their land in Mexico. And so they held a, an assembly, a general assembly with the, their townspeople. And they said, what are we going to do about this? And they voted and they decided we're going to go down with our blow torches and we're going to dismantle this pipeline, which should not be here. And we're going to sell it for scrap metal, right? How brilliant was that? That is direct action. Uh, we also cover things like um, how Sami forest defenders in um, Sweden are doing a tree sit and a blockade to stop the clear cutting of a forest. Um, a hummingbird species in Canada shut down a pipeline project that indigenous allies and, and organizers have been dedicatedly trying to stop from coming into existence. Um, we talk about how Turkey students in, at Turkey's university are opposing the um, the chancellor that was basically, or the regent that was appointed by Erdogan unilaterally. Um, so they don't want him. They see it as a dictatorial move. We talk about how women in Kyrgyzstan are standing up for their rights and against violence towards women. Uh, the stories follow things like Syria's rebel librarians who go out into the rubble of their city and collect books and store them underground in a, a hidden library that only uh, their friends and allies know about. So they're saving books and uh, lifting their spirits. In Yemen, women solved this water conflict that had been going on for 30 years. Imagine that, 30 years. And children had been getting shot during it. And they finally um, took a step forward, which is very unusual in their community. And they did a sit-in uh, where the men were supposed to figure this out. And they held them accountable to figuring out how the water was going to be shared between these two villages. So lots and lots of stories. And what it does is it really makes you rethink what is nonviolence and who's doing it. Um, it also gives all of us who are interested in nonviolence amazing examples to learn from in a way that is very vital, very vibrant, very right now. Um, and I think it's, it's an incredible way to get a glimpse of what, what we're doing as a human species and why it's so significant. Hmm. Beautiful. And, and yeah, you, as you, you, you update this every week. I do. Each and every single week, we find all of these kinds of stories and uh, we send it out in a newsletter and we post it on our website. So clearly um, so you have a team. You have, it's not, you're not doing this alone. You have other colleagues who work with you. I work with a small team. There's uh, two of us who do the editorial work. Uh -huh. And then there is also a couple of colleagues who, um, help with some of the back end work. We, um, we host conversations about the news uh, once a month. But you know, it's a small team doing this immense project. And it's uh, one of the ways that we can give back to the global community. Yeah, great. So this wide array of experiences, uh, what combination of hope and, and, and uh, well, challenge does it leave you with? Because when we look um, to the future, say the next 20 years or the next 50 years, I find that many people who are working with nonviolence 
have a great deal of hope they have a great deal of confidence and yet most of them are also facing very severe challenges so what for you is this dynamic between peril and promise i love that question um it, it's both right so the the funny thing about regular news is that we are asked to pay attention to the suffering we're asked to pay attention to the peril but what we're rarely given is the possibility is the hope um is the knowledge that people like us are doing very interesting uh very heartfelt and heartful um acts of nonviolent action to resolve this and they're succeeding far more often than we think when we see a success for movements it's often reported on as disconnected to the movement right a classic example is that a pipeline or a fossil fuel project will get canceled and the media will tell us oh it's because the market conditions are wrong it's not profitable to the company but really it's activists who have campaigned at the banks and the insurance companies uh and they've raised the cost of the project to such a point where it is not profitable but it's not because of you know the market it's because of us so nonviolence news uh, strives to give us back our power to see ourselves for how we hold power together and collectively and how we leverage that power against the classic um people that we think of as having so much um ability to cause harm in our world and i find this incredibly helpful and grounded in that hope um so you know there's a a thing that happens with nonviolence news is that every time i ask you to pay attention to an injustice or an act of suff or a type of suffering in our world i'm not leaving you in that place of despair I'm always connecting that to how people are protesting this. So we don't think it's normal and it's just going to happen forever. I'm connecting you to how they're going on strike or they're boycotting. I'm connecting you to the solutions that they're proposing, where some of which have decades of proven effectiveness. Yeah. So to me that's really important. I wish all of our news channels were doing that kind of legwork because th this part of the story is out there. Uh it's not invisible oftentimes activists are doing dramatic actions just to get people to know there's an alternative yeah um yeah so in closing rivera what advice can you share with young people because i can see from listening to you and to many others like you that it it takes some cultivation of inner resources to be able to do this work and uh many young people i find are drawn perhaps by instinct to nonviolence but they also wonder oh it must be so difficult or how does one you know walk this path in a world that takes nonviolence uh so treats it as so insignificant so what strengths would you uh advise and how they might cultivate Well first I want to say thank you to young people because actually in the US and globally you are part of uh one of the most active generations in the past 50 years. So thank you. I mean in the US you've been walking out of schools over over testing, gun violence, the climate crisis, uh not just at universities but at high schools and middle schools. Um so you're so inspiring you're part of such an incredible thing that's happening that is very hopeful and significant. So the second thing is uh just to think about the tools of nonviolent action as as essential or more essential than the training that we have to go through to get a driver's license for a car. Right? I mean, given the way public transit is going, many of us may never have to drive a car in our lifetimes. Uh but given the way the world is headed, all of us are going to have to know these tools and use them. Uh we are living in times of immense change, necessary change, and in many cases actually good change. The things that we are having to do to adapt to say the climate crisis or economic crisis are long overdue. And if we can do them, it's a world that most of us have only dared to dream of and long for and hope for and is very hopeful 
So to remember that there are more solutions out there than we're being told, that every problem we face, we actually have a fair number of answers to. That is not, our, that is not the problem. The problem is getting them implemented. And the tools of nonviolent action are extremely effective at doing this. We know in certain types of struggles, nonviolent action is twice as successful as violent means. In a third of the amount of time, which is important, especially around the climate crisis's timeline, and with a fraction of the casualties. So ironically, it's actually even safer than choosing to use violence. Um, but just to really, the, the thing I always like to think about for myself and for uh, young people as well, is that when we live in times of great change, we have to think about how we're thinking about the story of our lives. So are we uh, thinking that we're going to live in a sitcom, right? Are we thinking we're gonna live in a Cinderella story where we're gonna marry a rich prince and live happily ever after? Are we thinking we're going to live in a zombie apocalypse dystopia? Or are we thinking that we're going to live in a epic adventure where we are going to be called upon to be as brave as the heroes that we love in certain books and stories? Are we going to have to get out of our comfort zones the way that say Frodo or Bilbo Baggins in The Lord of the Rings had to? And what is gonna give us courage on the path? To me, knowing that we're not doing it alone is part of what keeps me going every day to know that we'll have good friends and that this kind of story for our lifetimes where the existential crisis is huge, is so epic that we are getting to live in one of the best times to be adventurers, to be heroic, to get to do wild and crazy and maybe even successful things. And that if we make it through these times, we'll look back at them and the things that we've done with pride, with um, a sense of accomplishment, with a sense of meaning and purpose that is so sky high that it will become the stuff of legends for all those who come after us. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajni. It's really people like you who make sure that the stories get told and the knowledge and the tools get passed on to those who need to hear it at exactly the moment they need to hear them. Yeah, and without, without this work, we would be living in darkness. We would have no way to know what our history is, what our potential is, what these tools are. And so what you're doing is very important and thank you for doing it. Well, yeah, well, it's only a tiny drop compared to what you're doing. So it is you that I bow to and uh, I can't, you know, we can't all of us thank you enough for uh, the range and the depth of things that you're doing. So God bless. Thank you.